Okay, we said last week that the, the gospel is urgent. As soon as John was arrested by Herod, Jesus went uh, directly from his wilderness experience where he was tempted by Satan, not into Jerusalem. That's kind of what you'd expect him to do. Uh, that would have been the logical place to gain a broad Jewish following. No, Jesus leaves the wilderness and heads north. Remember, he was baptized by John at the Jordan. That's about halfway point in, in Israel, if you, if you know geography at all. He's baptized by John in the Jordan, down by Jericho. And uh, he goes, goes off into the wilderness. I'll assume that was someplace out on the east, maybe into you know, what's now Iraq or something like that. I don't know. But uh, when he came back after those days of fasting and temptation, uh, Jesus took a boat, I assume, and went north up to Galilee. And uh, that just doesn't make sense to me. Jesus went into Galilee, bringing the right message at the right time, in the right place, to the right audience. That's what we said last week. It wasn't an audience in Jerusalem. It was an audience up in Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles. For in the fullness of time, the message was urgent, and Jesus had gathered his first disciples. And we see this scene, and you want to open the book of Mark, uh, to the first chapter of Mark. Mark's really condensed, only 16 chapters compared to the 24 or 28 of, of some of the others. And all in Mark 1, there's so much going on. He calls his first disciples. You're still in the first chapter. And he goes into Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is about halfway up on the lake, on the Sea of Galilee, which is itself at the north end of the Jordan River. Uh, although the Jordan River actually, the channel of the Jordan River goes right through the center of the Sea of Galilee and continues north of the sea. So it's, the Jordan's on both sides uh, and goes up into Syria before it ends. And um, so Jesus had gone up into Galilee, up to Capernaum, which is a little burg. It's not, it's not, this is not a big city. This is not a major place. But it happened to be a fishing village, and, and he comes into this fishing village of Capernaum, and that's where John and James and Peter and Andrew, the first four called, were from. The right audience, the right message, the right time, the right place. Follow me, Jesus had said, and I'll give you the privilege of fishing for people. And so they did. And then there's this word again. I said it last week. It happens so many times in, in Mark's gospel. Immediately. 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 Not in the temple of Jerusalem, but rather in a small synagogue in the backwater fishing village of Capernaum, way up on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus began to proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus went to Capernaum and went directly to the synagogue. A lot of other places he could have gone after he called his first apostles, first disciples. There's a lot of places he could have gone. They could have sat around by the boats and talked. But he, he takes these four men with him and probably some others uh, that ultimately become apostles. And the, he went directly into the synagogue, the place where Jews gathered mainly to hear various teachers expound on a wide range of subjects and about their relationship of those subjects to their religion that's what a synagogue was in those days. It was a place to do that. It usually also had a side room where you could pray privately if you wanted to. But the synagogues were mainly centers of teaching, of Jewish teaching, Jewish thought and teaching. And just as a side note, I want to make sure that, that I've taught you well. Synagogue means in Greek, it's not a Hebrew word, it's a Greek word, it means the same thing as ecclesia means in Greek. They're interchangeable words. And ecclesia in Greek means church. So the 
place and the gathering were the same thing. And church simply meant to them a gathering. It wasn't thought so much to be the, the place itself because dedicated buildings were rare. It was the gathering, the ecclesia, the synagogue, interchangeable words, the church. And that's where Jesus goes immediately, immediately, with urgency, to the place where Jews gathered to hear good teaching. It may seem strange to us to think of the church as primarily a place of teaching, not a place of worship. But the Jews didn't worship in their ecclesia. They didn't worship in their synagogue. They would pray there, but they didn't worship there. The only place that a Jew could worship was in Jerusalem, at the temple. And all Jewish worship was temple-focused because worship involved sacrifice, and you couldn't worship God without sacrifice. And what Chris read at the very beginning in the opening passage from John 4, the story of Jesus and a woman, a Samaritan woman, a woman from northwest, way up in the northwest part of Israel. And they were uh, of, a, of a kind of half-breed Jewish culture, and they believed that on the mountain was where you worshipped. And the Jews believed that in Jerusalem, at the temple, was where you worshipped. And Jesus said, God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. All right, that's all background. But immediately, immediately, Jesus goes to this synagogue. The urgency of the gospel that God is still speaking demands that we who are determined to speak salvation through Christ into the world learn from Jesus' example that we do the same thing. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That is, he didn't wait until Monday or Tuesday. The message that he carried was so vital and so urgent, and so he brings it at the very beginning of the week, on the Sabbath. Immediately, the gospel is urgent. Immediately, on the Sabbath, he entered the assembly and was teaching. God is still speaking. That's what we've said the last two weeks. And what was he teaching? Look up at verse 15 in your text. What was he teaching? We looked at this again last week. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what Jesus was teaching. And so he went into the synagogue and he began to teach on a Sabbath day. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what he was teaching. Oh, church, when you gather on a Sunday morning, does the worship of God so excite you that you're not content to be a spectator being led through ritual and sacrament? I wish, I really, truly wish that when worship was ended, that's the thing we just finished doing, that we couldn't get through taking the offering and announcements, but that some of you would be so compelled by the gospel that you had to speak. That you wanted to proclaim the word of God in Jesus so much that you didn't care to wait for whatever I might bring. You wanted to proclaim the word of God yourself the mighty praises of the one who was and who is and who is to come. See, the church in the first century knew that kind of excitement. Paul says to the Corinthians in a different place in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, when you gather together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everybody wants to get in the act. That's first century worship. They all wanted to proclaim Christ. Our churches today don't do that. We've trained ourselves out of it. Churches have a history, even if they did begin with that kind of openness. 
They have a history of falling into patterns of rote prayers, passionless praise, half-hearted song, because they let structure become law, and because they think that something must be added to the proclamation of the gospel to make it valid or to make it attractive or to make it relevant. This is the sort of well-ordered institutional synagogue that Jesus walked into on that Sabbath day in Capernaum. At the beginning of his public proclamation, when he was really excited, not Jesus was ever not excited, but he was really excited. The the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. There's no, no more urgent thing. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so that's where Jesus began to teach. But the minute that Jesus began to teach, that happened. The distractions began. (laughs) And and it's so, so easy. I I love it. You're going to find this later on in this message. It's so interesting. And that's not the only distraction. There's a buzzing in the sound system. Uh, or the the pipes in the radiator clank, or the sun's coming in through a window. Not today, but the sun's coming through a window. I, we a couple of weeks ago, we, half of us moved over here. Remember, and we were all sitting on this side because it was kind of a low Sunday. I never knew what you people have to go through on a Sunday morning. That's toughing it out when the sun's streaming in. Immediately, a distraction comes. It says, immediately there was in their synagogue a man. See it on the page where I am? Okay. Immediately there was in the synagogue, in their synagogue, a man. Was the man unknown to the members of the synagogue? Had he just come in off the street? No. The answer is absolutely not. And I'll show you in a minute why. Mark tells us that he had an unclean spirit. See, if he was known to have had an unclean spirit, he would have been known to be unclean and then would have been put out of the synagogue. But this man had an unclean spirit and everybody knew it, but no one did anything about it. That's why you can be sure that they already knew him. He shouldn't have been allowed to be where he was. He shouldn't have been allowed to be in the gathering, in the ecclesia, in the synagogue. He he shouldn't have been allowed to be there because he was with an unclean spirit. This one had gone unnoticed because up to this point, he had never said or done anything so out of the ordinary or so contentious that they were willing to take the risk and put him out. It's worth noticing at, in that sentence that the original sentence in Greek actually kind of works like this. It's, it's a little awkward to say it. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man, which means that their synagogue possessed a man. That means that he was a member. There was in their synagogue a man. And then it says... In an unclean spirit. Literally in the Greek it says in an unclean spirit. That is the man was fully engulfed in this spirit. He did not merely share his space or his presence, his body, with the presence of the spirit. He himself was so lost in the spirit that he had begun to disappear and the spirit to take over. In just the same way, how many people exercise such a presence in my church that it becomes unclear whether they are in the church or whether the church has become engulfed in their own overly large presence of control. This is my church, they say. So the first thing we learn from this passage is that corporate culture can be a distraction to the gospel. Jesus had come into their synagogue, into his synagogue. 
the synagogue that belonged to the man who belonged to the spirit. That's why no one cast him out. It was his synagogue, and no one dared. Jesus had begun to teach that the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God was at hand and that people should repent and believe the good news. And they were all astonished at his teaching because nothing like that had ever been proclaimed in their synagogue before. Why? The teaching that they had received to that point had no teeth in it. How does a church become possessed by its members? It becomes possessed by its members through toxic ownership. The church possessed by its members instead of the members possessed by Christ. The teaching that happened in this synagogue was so ineffective and so lacked authority that any unclean spirit would have been welcome there. And so a corporate culture of tolerance had invaded this place. Isn't one of the gifts of the Spirit listed in 1 Corinthians 12 the gift of discerning spirits? Would you recognize a false teacher if they began to speak here? Would you recognize a false teacher if they began to speak here? I pray that you would, and I fear that you might not. But this kind of thing is a done deal already the moment that a church begins to make accommodation for the ego of one or more of its members. That is how the man had the temerity to say, and this is how I know that this was his synagogue. He had the temerity to say, what do you have to do with us? Which is to say, this is my synagogue. I speak for all the members. How can you stay on message and proclaim the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel, when the, the status quo of the community that you're part of is all bound up in the egos of the owners of the community? How can you do it? And that's just the church. Do you belong to a club? Do you belong to a chorus? Do you belong to a band? Do you belong to a committee? Do you have a friendship circle that gets together with some regularity? What about your neighborhood, your extended family? What about your work group or the company that you work for? All of those communities each has a corporate culture. Unwritten rules of how we do things and how we behave with one another and what gets noticed. And what doesn't get noticed? The worst corporate cultures are driven by the egos of the members so that the mission becomes holding the community together at all costs. We have seen this kind of community rot over and over in the press in recent weeks. But Jesus always stays on message. Jesus always speaks truth into community in a redemptive way. He doesn't say, the time is fulfilled and your synagogue's days are numbered. He doesn't say that. He says, the time is fulfilled. Repent and believe. Jesus wasn't trying to get rid of members from the synagogue. Jesus stayed on message because the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand and the members will need community in Christ once they belong to him. Jesus stays on message and he says to the man, to the, to the spirit actually, he says, be silent and come out of him. He doesn't want to get rid of the person with the unclean spirit. He wants to get rid of the unclean spirit. Corporate culture, terrible distraction to the gospel. Second, the second distraction is what I call tradition. 
The man with the spirit wants to further distract attention away from Jesus' message by saying that Jesus has no authority here because he's a rabbi from Nazareth. What do you have to do with the members of my synagogue here in Capernaum? You're from Nazareth. You have no authority here. And, and you know the old saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? He's discrediting Jesus by saying this. Go back to Nazareth where you came from. We're doing just fine here. Woe to anyone who comes into any established church or group or club or corporate culture with a new idea. Oh, they'll, they'll let you say it. You can bring your idea, you can bring your, your plan to them. But try to implement the plan and you're going to be in very thin ice. Now, I'm not speaking here about just any idea. I'm, I'm speaking about a godly idea. You bring a godly idea with authority from Scripture, and a lot of times you bring it to the church, and the church will say, that's not how we do things. Unless the sharing of ideas with authority is cultivated in your group or your club or your church or your family over the years, Anything that is going to change the set traditions will be received with skepticism at best and hostility at worst. And the, as I've said before many times, the seven last words of every dying institution are, you can repeat it with me, we never did it that way before. Okay. Right? The third distraction is religion. Whoever thought religion could be a distraction? The man with the demon now tries to distract by accusing Jesus of being the very thing that Jesus is, by accusing him of being the Holy One of God. That is, he knows Jesus' name and yet denies Jesus' authority. The Apostle Paul mourns over church people like this when he calls them lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Maybe they have the ritual, the organ, the band, the stained glass window, the baptistry, the table, and the pulpit. Maybe they got all that. Yet there is no release of the resurrection power of God because they prefer other pleasures over the pleasure of knowing Jesus. They prefer the pleasure of ritual over the pleasure of knowing Jesus. They prefer the pleasure of music over the pleasure of knowing Jesus. They prefer the pleasure of community over the pleasure of knowing Jesus. Some even prefer the pleasure of the quest for social justice over the pleasure of knowing Jesus. And they will tell you what they would tell him if he walked into their ecclesia, their synagogue, their church. Sure, we, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. Just don't mess up our worship or our community or our service. Look, anything, even the work of the church, when valued above the pleasure of knowing Jesus, is just a false idol. Paul, writing again to Corinth in the passage we read when we were worshiping together, says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. People in churches are always in danger of thinking that we know something. <laughs> you have no idea how easy it is after you've gone to seminary to think that you know something. It used to be that because Christians knew, put that in quotes, because Christians knew that dancing and card playing and alcohol and other pleasures had the potential of leading you away from the pleasure of knowing Christ, the church made those things absolute no-nos. About 10 years ago, that all changed. And my son invited me to, to a teaching time up in Boston that was put on by the Christian Fellowship at Harvard University. Very distinguished. It was called Theology on Tap. And was held in the back room of the Cheers Bar on Boston Common. Everybody brought their 
pint of good beer and sat with their Tweety suits on and listened to an author bring an important teaching about the intersection of Christ and culture. It was a wonderful, wonderful teaching, complete with slides back when they had slides, right? What had happened? We traded taboo for liberty. How are we to know when our freedom in Christ is good and when it's simply an excuse to drink or to gamble or to hook up? How are we to know when our rules are bad? Paul tells us that the test is love. At the core of love is the proclamation of the gospel. Stay on message, and it will become clear to you. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the message. Don't let even religion become a distraction to your proclamation. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel is uncomfortable, and many will not tolerate it. And many of us are reluctant to speak a message of repentance into a person's religious comfort for fear of rejection. And so we take liberties or offer liberties or we offer law and legalism. Jesus spoke truth and he did it in redemptive love. Now there's one final distraction we want to look at. I love this. It says, And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. What a lot of noise. Noise, noise, noise. Noise is a great distractor to the gospel. For years, I have met with people mostly in diners, sometimes in coffee shops, and yes, sometimes in bars. And the reason is, that these are public places, these are normal places. These are not religious places. These are places where the expectation is that we will have a true dialogue, where, where we'll be able to really discuss things. You come into my office and, and we're gonna have a pretty tamped down conversation, why? Because it's religious, we're in the pastor's office. It's like being called into the principal's office when you're a kid. But places like Friendly's and Dom's and Ruby Tuesday's and the Whistle Stop, those can all be the most sacred spaces in the world because holy business can be conducted there. As long as I really plan to conduct holy business. And don't let my own need to be loved and accepted take over. It's the easiest thing to do when you're sitting just with a friend your whole plan goes out the window because you want to be something to them. The funniest thing happens nearly every time I intend to speak gospel truth into a conversation. The moment that I begin to talk about Jesus, someone will turn up the volume on the, on the TV, somebody two tables over will begin ranting about politics, a couple nearby will have an argument, or a group at the next table will spend 20 minutes loudly discussing their ailments. When the people stepped into the synagogue at Capernaum that day, I'm pretty sure that the last thing that they expected was for the orderly teaching that they were used to to be disrupted by an outburst, a cry, and the convulsion of a man writhing on the floor. In a situation like that, it's almost impossible for anybody to continue a conversation, much less to continue a focused teaching of the gospel and to be heard and understood. But remember, Jesus does something unique with this commotion. He, te he speaks truth in a redemptive way and finally commands the demon to depart. Far from being distracted, Jesus sees 
the distraction is an opportunity for the gospel. Some situations need your attention. You may want to stop what you're saying to your friend and, and just, you might be the right person to help a young mother with her toddler. You can suggest to the waiter that the music or the TV is too loud for good conversation. That's okay. It's not against the rules, although it may be against the corporate culture of that place. You may be just the right person to speak truth to a pastor who is trying to be cool and say, can we get back on message, please? You may not be called on to cast out a literal demon, but you may be used to say, this distraction doesn't work here. I just read in the New York Times that according to a Pew Research study, some of you might have seen this, by 2010, the average preteen, preteen, was consuming some electronic media 7.5 hours a day. And that number has risen in the last seven years to where the article I read concluded that many young people are so involved with their screens that they are attached to a screen almost continuously. And that the average adult now spends 10 hours a day in front of some screen. I'm not saying that electronic media don't offer or doesn't offer a great wealth of helpful information. But if you really want to help the person that you're with, and you really want to be present in a conversation, and you really want to say, as I hope you really want to, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. If you really want to say that to people, then here's what you'll do. You'll tell the person that you're with. You'll overcome your fear of corporate culture. You'll overcome your fear of traditions of, of our conversation or of our community. You'll overcome even your fear of their understanding of religion. And you will tell them to put their cell phone in their pocket and put the ringer on silent. And then you will model the same for them and it will convey to the person who you are with that they are important and that what you are talking about is important. And I don't need to look up the thing that uh, we were all questioning. I really don't. It's a temptation, but I don't need to look it up right now. I can look it up later. And you will have gained connection with somebody and you'll have gained an opportunity for a greater more focused conversation with the gospel and you'll be experiencing a renewed ability to overcome distractions beloved you have the most important message in the world to proclaim jesus christ is lord the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand in jesus repent and believe in the gospel don't let corporate culture or tradition or religion or noise get you off message. All right, let's pray.